Hello, everyone. I hope the lunch was awesome. <laughs> um, we have today opportunity, or, or we are blessed to have a, a guy from Google, right? Uh, Martin. And um, I heard that you like to swim. I do. I do indeed. My mic is on, I okay, think. Okay, so yeah. tell me about that swimming. I, I heard it's a very <laughs> interesting thing that you do. I mean, it's not like common. Yeah, so um, in Switzerland, we are very lucky that we have a lot of really clean and nice rivers, and I work in Zurich. So we have a river that basically comes from the mountains, goes into a lake, and then goes through the city. Mm -hmm. And so our offices are here, and I live here, mm -hmm. and the river goes like this. And you just jump down. And I just go into the river, I leave my laptop in the office, get a dry bag that has all my mm -hmm, clothes mm -hmm. in, and then just like swim in the river for a while, get out, dry myself in the sun, and then just take the bus home for the last couple of minutes. Wow, awesome. That, that sounds like a nice way like, to commute. <laughs> it is a really nice way. It is indeed a really yeah, nice awesome. way. Awesome. Yeah. You also do some things for kids? Like, uh, uh, is yes. this a part of the Google or um, it's your own So thing? I do it as part of Google, but okay. there's also other things that I do without the support of Google, really. Um, so we do Lego workshops. So we do like robot workshops for kids. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Cool, that's that's cool. fantastic. Because we also have idea to start uh, something like this here. Yeah. We actually started something, but cool, awesome. So enjoy his talk, and that's it. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, one person clapping. That's interesting. That's fine. How was lunch? Yeah, it was good. Wonderful. You can also come closer if you wish. Like, there's plenty of space here, and it's a little weird to like see people in the far distance. But I know it's like in school, you don't want to sit in the first row, I guess. So. Um, we are not in school, though, so don't worry too much about it. And my clicker stopped working. That's fantastic. All right. Yes. No. Yes. Cool. So yeah, uh, my name is Martin Splitt. I am a Google developer advocate. Uh, I work for Google in Zurich, Switzerland, as you have heard. I mean, I swim Swiss rivers, so there we go. And uh, I really like the, this, this thing so that you can make your own Octocad these days, and that's pretty fantastic. So this is probably going to be my avatar. As you can see, if you looked at the schedule and saw my picture there, something has changed. I got a new haircut, and, uh, and I got a new hair color as well. I also, when I'm not working at Google, or when I'm working at Google, it depends on what kind of thing. I work at Web Standards, so I have been working with the uh, web components in the past. I've been working with the WebXR APIs. Uh, in the past, so I, I did a little bit of things here and there. Um, and I'm a, cho a Swiss chocolate evangelist. However, I have to admit, yesterday I got a little hungry, so I ate the Swiss chocolate I brought. I'm sorry, but I guess I'm going to come back to Serbia at some point and I'll bring you more Swiss chocolate. Um, all right, enough about me. More interestingly, let's talk about XR, so extended reality. So first things first, um, I have a question for you all. You know, I know it's lunchtime or basically past lunchtime. So you had a bunch of food and maybe you had a bit of, a bit of coffee. So you're still like, ah, I'm going to sit down. And then the food coma sits in, right? So, then, ah. so who here does not like to raise their hands? Show me your hands. <laughs> yeah, this is a hard one, right? It's like, oh, I hate raising my hand. but. Oh, wait, no. Oh, this is a trick. Um, anyway, moving on. So let's talk about a few things that I like to get out of the way. Because there's a bunch of hype about AR and VR, but there's also a bunch of... I'm not sure if this is recorded, but I don't care at this point. There's a bunch of bullshit out there. So you might th see these brilliant conceptions about like VR and AR, and some companies do things like this. I mean. This is an advertisement for an insurance company. You should not VR and drive. That's, that's a terrifying idea. So, well then, what are we talking about when we are talking about AR and VR and XR and what do all these mean? So I think like, we, we should start with the terminology. So there's a bunch of terminology out there that is not really helping. And depending on who you are looking at or who you are lo listening to or what you're reading, um, these terms can mean very different things, but there are a few definitions that might help you understand what's going on. And specifically, these definitions will help you throughout the talk. So if you look at it, we have a bit of a spectrum here. On one end of the, one end of the spectrum, we are fully in the reality that we are in right now, and hopefully we share this reality. 
which would be fantastic if you would follow me in this reality here. So we are in the real world, and then we can drive into or dive into the virtual world more and more. So let's, let's look at that uh, from our perspective. So we are right now here in the real world. There's no devices around. Well, we have our phones and computers around us. But right now, we are sharing this moment in the real world. So we are all hanging out together. We can talk to each other. Well, right now, I talk to you and you listen. Sorry for that. But you can come back with questions later on. Um, and we are, we are enjoying this reality entirely. We're not using anything virtual around us. But then on the other end of the spectrum, it gets more into the virtual world. And the first step into that is augmented reality. Now, what is augmented reality? Well, you might have seen applications where you have like your phone and you see something that is not actually there. Or if you saw the videos from Magic Leap or any of the other companies or uh, had ever tried a HoloLens, then you know that you're still seeing the room around you. You still see the people around you. You can talk to the people around you. But there are additional elements inside the thing that you see inside the reality that you perceive that are not actually in the physical reality. Might be certain parts, might be certain objects, might be other people. They're being projected into your eyes and basically appear as if they were part of the real reality around you, but they are not. So they augment reality. So there's additional things and objects and uh, characters that are not there in the real world. That's what augmented reality does. Then it gets a little blurry already because Mixed reality depends on who is saying that word, what it means. So originally, mixed reality is an evolution of augmented reality. Because if I have an augmented reality headset or, or device, um, and there is an object that is not actually physically there, it is virtually there, but then blended into my reality, it's going to have the right shadows, um, and it's going to maybe look realistic. But if I reach into it, I basically reach through it. I can't actually interact with this object. If I throw something, it's going to go through this virtual object. Mixed reality is originally planned or was supposed to be one step further where this object would interact with the surroundings. So either if I throw something, it would like move to the side of it or like disintegrate for a moment. Or uh, if, I, if I move the lights, then it's going to adjust the shadows and stuff like that. But that was only the academic reality. We never had devices that actually properly supported this because you also have to get the haptics and you have to get the, the audio um, right. So actually what this means now, it's Microsoft's marketing term for their virtual reality headsets. So right now, mixed reality does not really exist on the market, unfortunately. Maybe Magic Leap might bring something to the market that actually does this. So then there's not much in this, in this middle bit, but the only thing that is left in our des uh, description or our terminology course is the virtual reality. Virtual reality is when I completely ignore my physical reality. I completely shut it out. I just entirely pretend to be in a virtual place that has no no connections to the virtual, uh, to the physical reality that I'm in. So the, we have this, this dif uh, differences here. The thing there is, a lot of people then come to me and ask me, so what do you think will win? What is better? What is more successful? What is more useful? Whatever. Uh, is it AR or is it VR? And I ask, like, what's better, an apple or an orange? If you hate apples, then clearly the orange is better or vice versa. But the point is, it's completely different things. And if you look at it, um, we basically have a spectrum that is encompassed in extended reality, but within that, the edges where or the points where virtual reality and augmented reality are are very, very far apart from each other, and they serve different purposes. Specifically, virtual reality is basically taking you from where you are right now into a virtual place, any place. Can be a real place, can be a fictional place. It doesn't have to be an actual physical space. Uh, it can take you anywhere. It is a teleporter, basically. It takes you somewhere or the user somewhere else, right? It's a teleporter. It does not make any use of the environment that you've actually got. It takes you someplace else. Whereas the augmented reality is actually quite different. It, it is a tool for a different purpose because it doesn't take you somewhere else. It leaves you where you are, but it gives you additional powers. It gives you additional abilities. Most often, that is a visual ability. You see things that you don't normally see. So one um, possible uh, application for, for augmented reality could be maintenance. If you're standing in front of a very complex machine, let's say like a jet engine, you stand in front of this jet engine with all the little pipes and, uh, 
and uh, cables and stuff, and you're like, what, what does this mean? And you basically then have to use a manual to figure out, so this thing is this, I believe, and then what is, what is this? this isn't he what the hell? So if you're using AR, it gives you additional information. It might overlay, yeah, this cable here, that's the cable you're looking for, or this, you have to remove this cable to get to this other cable. So you see something that you normally don't see. But it doesn't have to be visual. It can also be you smell or taste or hear something that you normally can't hear. So if you're using a, a, an AR application that lets you maybe communicate with birds, then it might actually tell you like what the birds are trying to communicate to you around you. That's also augmented reality, because in the real reality, you just hear them chirp, but you don't know what that means. But if there's a magical AR application that tells you what that means, then it actually overlays this information about the physical reality for you so that you can perceive something that you can't normally perceive. So it's like a magic portal. It's like a window into another world uh, in whatever way that, that needs to be in this case. It can also be like x-ray vision. So if you're in the building and you're uh, inspecting a building, then it can give you the data that the sensors are measuring within the concrete, for instance. You're not seeing the strain in the concrete, but it can overlay this information on the concrete physical uh, concrete that you're touching right now um, to help you figure out if there's any deficiencies. So they are completely different use cases. We're not having hardware that supports these different use cases in one go. But you could imagine this, so I, I like to make this fictional example, it doesn't exist, but basically you could have a piece of glasses that is capable of like either showing you the world around you or completely like blacking it out. And I could, it could give me directions. So I'm traveling to a different country and I have to go somewhere. So it gives me directions and, and now you go into that metro line and now you sit down, okay? And now you have to ride this metro for 30 minutes. And then you know how metros can be, especially in the morning or buses for that matter. Like I, I know how buses can feel like, especially in Zurich when it gets like a little crowded and you're like, uh, and you see like a lot of things that you don't want to see very up close. So what you, this, this headset could do, it could go like, well, you're here for 30 minutes, so I might as well just not show you all these sweaty people around you. I might show you a nice little nature thing where you can like look around and you have birds chirping and you have a really good time and maybe there's someone narrating something to you or something happening in front of you. I could watch a sports game as if I would be in the stadium. So I, my brain is tricked into believing that I am in a stadium watching my favorite kind of sports. In my case, that would be American football. And I would like watch the game and I'm like, yeah, yeah. And they can look around me like, yeah, these people are having a great time. I'm having a great time because I'm with people having a great time. Great. Um, but then it might go like, oh, after half an hour, it goes like, wait, cut. You have to get out at the next stop. And then it switches back to reality and helps me, guides me out of the, the bus or metro to the destination that I have to go to. We're not having this hardware yet, but that would be a case where virtual reality and augmented reality are blended. It takes me somewhere else when I'm in a situation where I don't want to be or I don't, I'd rather like to be somewhere else. And then it brings me back to the physical reality around me, but augments it with information that I need to do whatever I have to do at the time. Cool. Yeah, that's all nice and fine. But if you're working for a company that usually either consults clients or does projects for other people, why would you care? Is this something that you should look into? I mean, it seems to be like very artificial use cases and I haven't actually seen that much um, being done with it in the real world. Well, let me, let me convince you. So first things first, there's a bunch of different industries. One of them being the education industry. And education is important and actually a growing sector uh, in a lot of countries. But the budget might be small, especially in a lot of countries that can't afford um, expensive hardware or expensive software to teach um, either kids or, or grown-ups. So you can use VR to bring the people you need to educate to places that they can't go physically. You can explore the Great Barrier Reef to understand the Im environment impact that you are having there. Or you can take them to space to teach them about like space and science and, and physics and stuff like that. Or you can just take them to ancient Rome to experience how the history of democracy unfolded in Greece and Rome. I mean, time travel is still pretty expensive these days, I hear. You can also use it in healthcare. So healthcare, another growing sector and an important sector, can benefit multiple ways from VR and AR. So there was a study with, op uh, with, with victims of uh, severe burns. So people that burned substantial areas of their, their skin are suffering very bad pain. And the, the therapy, the manual therapy to like, keep the, the, um, the skin 
um, that is healing after the burn elastic enough is actually pretty painful. So the question then became, how can we make this less painful? We can't avoid this physical therapy. We have to move uh, the skin that was burned to, uh, to al allow it to like, heal and stay elastic. So to remove the pain, someone thought, well, we can trick the brain into believing that it's somewhere else, not in a hospital, not doing this very physical and painful task. So how about we use VR for this? So they basically had programs developed that took the patients out in a really nice and pleasant environment and kept them busy with like little tasks and made, made sure that they are like occupied, mentally occupied with something else. And then they had them rate the, the um, um, feeling of pain or the sensation of pain. So the levels of pain that was rated between treatments with and without VR were 30% lower. So you have a 30% improvement in the perceived pain. The, the physical activity was the same. It was still the therapy and it was still painful, but the pain was perceived as less painful because of tricking the brain into thinking that you are somewhere completely different. And that's fantastic. And that's only one of the two sides of it. You can also use VR in healthcare or AR in healthcare to support doctors, either by training them so you can have a virtual reality experience where your brain really thinks like, okay, this is high tension environments. I have to have an emergency surgery here. And it's, it's, uh, it's very complicated. It's neurosurgery or something like that. Um, and you really believe that you're in the situation, but you're not in the situation. So if you have like a, a fake model that you can train on and, and operate on, um, the virtual reality adds the stress levels and adds to the, the training experience without having to actually use patients. And that's something that to me, as a potential patient, is really reassuring. You can also use AR to help them because, you know, if you're operating, you need a lot of data and information and you might need to get certain insights and information really quickly. So if we can overlay that over the physical reality of the medical uh, professional operating, that's really, really great. So healthcare is another way of, of working with it. <coughs> now, maybe not many people here are working in healthcare or education. So any other things? Yeah, tourism. Try before you buy. You want to have a feeling for how a certain place might feel or might be like, or you might find it. So again, our brain is tricked into believing to be somewhere else. So you can explore different places and can be like, all right, yeah, I want to do this. I want to, I like this. And um, psychology shows us that why, why do we have these car configurators? If you want to buy a car, you get all these configuration options because you can make it your own. You can try it out. You can, you know, play around with it, get a, get a feeling for how it looks like, how it would feel like. Um, and then you are more invested in it. You are more likely to buy because you are invested in it. You made it your own. So the same goes for, um, for tourism. If you get to configure your hotel room or if you get to configure your trip uh, and get to choose a, a bunch of destinations by pretending to be there, you are more emotionally invested in it and you can use that to persuade people to buy something, um, which in tourism is actually pretty handy. Last but not least, that leads us, that segues us into marketing. Um, again, you want to persuade people to actually invest in something, to buy something. Um, you can do so by showing them. And, you know, a lot of things are very um, physical, are very real in, in three dimensions in front of us if we buy the actual product, but we can't really try it out. I mean, perfume, okay, sure, you can like take it out and like go, ch -ch -ch, and, oh, okay, I like the smell, but cars, or flats are not necessarily that easy, especially if you're trying to, to sell offices or uh, apartments that haven't even been built yet. We are literally talking about spaces. So a flat or an apartment or an office is a space, right? You want to walk through it. You want to have a look at that. Ah, so how does it look if I look out of the window? You can do this. You can make people experience this in virtual reality, which gives them a better understanding than any video or photo will ever do. Because photos and videos fundamentally are two-dimensional. So we're trying to get a space into two dimensions. That's not going to be very enticing, not very interesting, and not very accurate either. You can get very accurate and interesting experiences if you give people the space to walk around it, to explore it. And the technology is there for this, and people are already doing it. And you can use it in design and engineering and also manufacturing, actually. So I think Intel and Coca-Cola um, use augmented reality in their logistics. So they are basically trying to get information to the people as quickly as possible and in the place that they need it at. So basically, if I stand in front of a certain shelf, 
it's good that if the thing basically was like, look over there, and you're like, oh, all right, there it is, there we go. And they see like between 10 and 30% of improvement in terms of cutting costs and uh, increasing efficiency um, using these technologies. And the same goes for manufacturing and, and in terms of uh, engineering and design. You want to be able to like try different things out and see how they play out in space. Again, augmented reality and virtual reality can help with that. And last but not least, we get to explore and be creative. And I think that's fantastic because we've, we've played around with different mediums. Um, we started basically painting walls of caves. That's how arts more or less started. And um, we, we, were, we are stuck to, to paint and uh, canvas for a long time. We now have computers. We're not really making use that much of computers yet. And we have video and we have video artists. But now you get to use the space with apps like Google Tilt Brush. You can actually create and sculpt in three dimensions with materials that you normally don't work with. I don't know how much lava you have at home. I don't have that much. But I can literally like paint with fire. I can paint with water. I mean, I can use water at home to make something, but I don't think that's going to look great, and especially with all the mess that I'm going to create afterwards. And you can also actually paint with music. So this has colors that are re responding to music as you play it. I know that you can use acid for that, but prolonged drug usage is actually not good as it turns out. So you basically get the same effect, but you don't have to drug yourself, which is quite fantastic. And you get to share this as well. Like Other people can explore it in, in the comfort of their home. I mean, they can do that with acid as well, but again, that has a bunch of side effects that you want to avoid. So yeah, this is a bunch of, of different industries, and I think it's like a pretty much, it goes more or less everywhere. The retail is in there as well somewhere. So you know, there's like a bunch of different possibilities. So I think it, it makes sense from a business perspective to look into this as well. Cool. So speaking of business, what is the landscape looking like? Like, what should I deal with? What are the, uh, the systems that support this? What is the hardware? that we've got. Well, one of the pieces of hardware that I grab out, I'm not going to give you the full list because it's, it's growing every day, but like one of the first higher end experiences was the Oculus Rift, quickly followed by the HTC Vive. The HTC Vive has controllers with a bunch of buttons and I can put one into each of my hands and I have like full control over what's happening in the virtual world with my hands, with two of my hands. It also has these trackers so I can move around in space. I can basically, these trackers know if I'm standing here or here. So I can walk around things and I can like duck, I can like bend over them. It tracks these motions so I get what's called a room scale experience. This comes at a price point of around 600 euros. Excluded is that you need a computer that is around 500 euros on top of that because the computer has to support it. This is using cables. Actually, there's now a Wi-Fi adapter, so you don't have to use cables anymore. Um, <clears throat> but you still need a computer that it's tethered to. The Oculus Go is a piece of soft, uh, hardware that doesn't have this requirement anymore. There's also the Samsung Gear VR. Um, Samsung Gear VR works with pretty much a, a bunch of different Samsung phones, but you have to have a Samsung phone for that that supports this. Uh, but it also comes at a lower price. And it doesn't need an additional device. You just have to have your Samsung phone. Um, but it comes as another downside. Like you might have, I think they now sell controllers as well, but you have like a one hand controller, so no two hand interactions. And there's no trackers. Why is that a bad thing? Because it means it doesn't make a difference if I'm standing here or here. It doesn't know if I'm moving around in space. You could use the accelerometers, but they're really inaccurate for these kind of things. So you actually, the only experience you get is you can look around yourself and you can probably like do some smaller motions like this or this, but you basically just like get to, to look around. You can't really move around in space, so you're a little more limited there. Oftentimes, it turns out that's not a problem. And people really like the fact that they don't have to be tethered to a computer. So this is more for the entertainment use cases or the educational use cases um, where you don't have to necessarily move around. Marketing and tourism actually work really well with, with just uh, standing or sitting experiences as well. And then there's this one. So someone at Google figured, so if we already use smartphones and they have a display and they have sensors, we can also just use a bit of cardboard and plastic lenses. And this is a little cheaper. So we're not really seeing these much anymore because they have been so commoditized. So like these things exist 
um, quite everywhere. And let's have a look at this. So these are sales statistics um, for different devices. Again, I sampled some. So we see like Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, each around half a million devices sold in 2017. Half a million, that's good. That's not bad. This is one point some million already. That's, that's pretty great as well. Daydream, um, uh, actually, I'm not sure about these numbers uh, because they basically like, started ramping up. I think this includes some of, of 2016 as well. Um, but then we have the Gear VR, and we see like, so the mobile VR experience goes, goes above and beyond. So like, if this is like one point something million, then here we are above two million by far. So we have more than two million devices in the market for mobile virtual reality. Newer devices such as the Oculus Go, which only came out in 2017, so I thought it's unfair to include it here. Um, they are actually making this market in as well because they are also not using a, a, a computer that they are tethered to, so that's pretty fantastic. But there's some player is missing here, and that's the cardboard. Because there's only over 80 million, 180 million, over 80 million devices have been sold and are in the wild. So we see like, nice, but yeah. So we get a very low end experience. This is not a high end experience. Someone put their phone in and it has like one button and that's it. So you have a button and you can look around. You can't walk around, you can't do like two hand gestures. But this is unfortunate because that means like I would have to build one thing for the cardboard and then another thing for the nicer, higher level or higher, higher quality VR devices. And that's unfortunate. But I don't have to do that. So who here has an Oculus? Or an HTC Vive? Or a cardboard? Or a Daydream? Or a Gear VR? Who here has a browser? That's what I thought. So you have browsers pretty much everywhere. Wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of responsive design that allows you to explore the three-dimensional contents using your browser and then enhancing it with whatever device you've got? Conveniently, we've got that. And uh, the way we can do this is we can use the WebXR API, which encompasses all sorts of devices. It works on pretty much all devices these days. Um, and you can detect what kind of device you've got and what kind of capabilities you've got and adapt to it. Because I've, I've oftentimes, so I have an HTC Vive at home and um, it's the one with the two controllers, that's great. But these two controllers are wireless. That means they have a battery inside that you have to recharge every now and then, right? You have no idea how often I wanted to play a game only to find out that one of my controllers wasn't charged. So I'm like, okay, I can't use this controller. I have to charge it first, but I'm going to play the game anyways. I, I mean, I'm, I'm like basically having a saber and I'm like, or lightsaber and I do like some fights with it. So one controller is more than enough, right? No, because developers were like, nice. This guy has hardware that has two controllers. So you have to have two controllers to play this game. And if you have two controllers, basically all you do is like you fight with one and then you shield with the other. I'm like, I'm good at fighting. I don't need to shield myself. Just let me, you know, and if I die, I die. That's fine. I just want to play it. That's all right. But they don't let me. They don't let me. They are like, no, you have to have two controllers. One controller is disconnected. We are not starting. Sorry. Don't do that. And on the web, you can easily figure out, oh, yeah, there's only one controller. Well, then we're going to load the version or do the thing that works with one controller versus we're going to do the thing that requires two controllers. And um, there's the thing that confuses a few people. So we have the WebXR API, but it's not actually doing 3D graphics on the browser. For 3D graphics on the browser, we have a different API. It's called WebGL. So if WebGL does all the drawing and does all the 3D graphics, what exactly does the WebXR API do? Well, a lot of important things as well. First things first, it tells us if there is a VR headset and if the browser supports WebXR. So if it does, then we can choose to use the features. And one of the many features that we need is we need to figure out what kind of capabilities we've got. Can we actually move around in space or do we only have the orientation? And what are those? So basically, the WebXR API gives us the information about what kind of information we get from the headset and how this information reads right now. So it tells us the user is looking in that direction and, if possible, stands over here and walks in that direction. So we get orientation and position, uh, position only if possible. 
It also extends the GamePad API. The GamePad API is the API that gives you access to the controllers. So we have access to all the touchpads and all the buttons and, and the position as well. So we know where in space our controller or controllers are, if there are any, if they are charged, if they are discharged, um, and we can use them as we would any other input device on the web. Cool. Where is it supported? Well, it's surprisingly supported in many different platforms and, and browsers. So Firefox shipped it. Firefox Nightly does a bunch of experimental stuff if you want to see the more experimental things. Chrome on Android supports it. Uh, Chromium on Windows and I think Linux and Mac OS as well support it behind the flag. So you have to set a flag, unfortunately. Um, Edge supports it. Edge supports it since version like 11. So wow. Or, actually, no, that's not true. 12. I think Edge 12 uh, shipped it. Samsung Internet supports it since forever, basically. I see that some, some Samsung folks might be here. And then we have like the weird ones, like uh, Carmel is an experimental browser from fa uh, Facebook, and then Servo is an experimental browser from Microsoft. They also support it. And this is how you get started. Very simple. Of course not. No, God, no. Oh, my God. This, this is WebGL code that draws a triangle. So like we set up a few points here, and then we put that into graphics memory, and then we compile a few shaders. The shader code isn't even here. What the hell is a shader? As a JavaScript developer, you're like, what? Don't worry about it. Like, bullshit. So we're not really, we're not doing this. We are, no. No way. Screw it. Don't do that. Ignore this. What we do instead is we'll have a try with some higher level library. All right. So let's see. Escape. Yeah, thank you. All right, so, oh, I presented from the wrong browser window. That's fantastic. Um, this was the one that I actually wanted to use. That's OK. So here we've got, whoa, OK, it reloads. Fantastic. Here we've got a reloading website. So here we have a little website. Um, I hope that you can read the code. I checked earlier. If you can't read the code, there's plenty of seats here. Don't give me hate for it later on. There's plenty of space here. We are loading a little library that is called A-Frame. This A-Frame library has been created by um, Mozilla and is an open source project. Also, if you don't know, this Hacktoberfest, it's October. So if you make five pull requests to open source projects this month on GitHub, you get a free t-shirt if you're signing up for hacktoberfest.digitalocean.com. It's a cooperation from Microsoft, DigitalOcean, and Twilio, as far as I'm aware. There might be some other companies helping out. So we have a pretty boring website here. Uh, all it does is it has a, has a headline. That's not very exciting. But I can use this other thing here. There's this A scene here. So now, what is the A scene? The A scene is basically, so A-Frame is a library that allows us to create a virtual world in the browser, which I think is fantastic. The way you can do this is you start with an empty space, which is the scene. It's empty. It doesn't have anything in it. But we can put stuff into it. So for instance, I can say, I want a box. And I want this box to be red, because why not? And now the problem is this box is so we have, a, have the user, basically. The user stands at 0, 0, 0 and looks into the space. But if we are, if we are putting the, the box there as well, the box is around us, so we can't really see the box. So we have to move it a little bit. And I'm moving it. I'm moving it. Um, I'm moving it 1.6 meters up. Why 1.6 meters? Well, because I, we stand at 0, 0, 0, but our eyes are not in the feet. We have height, right? So for me, it's like 1 meter 89, 1 meter 90, where my, my head stops. It's like 1 meter 85, maybe, is where my eyes are. I don't know. But unless we have a device that actually supports this, like this entire motion thing, like the HTC Vive or the Oculus Rift or the um, Microsoft um, Mixed Reality headsets, then we don't know how tall the user actually is. But 1 meter 60 is a good approximation. Even if you're actually taller in physical world, you're not going to see that much of a difference. So we make this 1 meter 60. So these are meters, actually. And we move it 2 meters into the screen. So like the last value here, the, X, the, the Z value, tells you how much out of the screen it comes. And we want to go into the screen. So minus 2. And if we do that, we get this. Well, that's not very exciting, is it? But A-Frame tries to make us successful. So the way it makes us successful is it gives us controls as well. So now here, I can't really use my hat to move the camera. But I can use, for instance, my mouse. And this comes basically for free. So we get to like look around and walk around. 
And we can make this more complex. We can code more complex things, so I can go in the code, or I use the visual developer tools. It has visual developer tools that we can use to make our scene happen. So I can click on a thing, and then here we see like I can move it around, I can also move it up if I wanted. So if we are now going back, and I actually zoom out again, then it's above us. And we can do all sorts of things. And here we see something really nice. So all of the different properties are components. So an A box has a geometry. This is the shape that it uses. I can change the shape. And here are a few options that it gives me. So one is the torus knot. And the torus knot looks really funny. So let's go back. So here we go. We have a pretzel. Hurrah. Right? If I don't like the color, that's OK. I, I don't have to like this color. I can go to the material component that I gave a red color to. And I can just click on it. Whoops. Ah. And then I get a color picker. So I can now change it to be mm, bluish. Whoa broken here. That's fantastic. All right. It is broken this time, but normally you can change the color. Trust me on that one. I can also just go down here. Can I? Yeah, I can. And just say like blue, and then it turns blue as well. And if I go back, there we go. It is blue. Now, I don't want to have to recode all of this, so I'm just going to click on uh, the copy button. I'm going to remove this box. I'm going to put this in here. And you can do all sorts of things like this. You can even use JavaScript to dynamically change these things. And I can give you this URL, and on your phone, it's going to look the same. That's it. And if you have a VR headset, you can now walk around it, or at least like look around in space. And this is the, the really nice way of building virtual worlds around you, which is fantastic. And this is the wrong browser window, but this is the right browser window. And, um, and yeah, so this is, this is pretty great. And I'm going to run you through a very few important steps on, the on top of this. First things first, you can do augmented reality as well. We're not going to watch this video right now. But you have to make sure that your input makes sense. So this one is not a good experience. So don't ever think that you know what is good input. You want to make sure that you understand what is good input by testing it out. So someone thought, like, yeah, my hands are perfect input devices for a game of chess and virtual reality. But if you don't actually feel the pieces, it's not that great as you can see by the sentiment expressed at the end of this GIF. Let's watch it one more time. Not a happy user. Another thing is we have to think of the UX. So if we want to monetize things, we have to figure out how to do this. And the classical ways of monetizing might not be the right way of monetizing this. So you have to understand that the experience is very different because you feel like you are in a virtual place and you don't want to be bombarded with weird stuff and you know, not a good experience either. Also, performance is really important. If you're looking at a screen where an animation is playing, 60 frames per second are fantastic. It's silky smooth and really nice. 30 frames per second, yeah, OK, that's fine. That's, that's OK. It's still, it janks a little bit, but it's still mostly like moving and it's good. That's nice. But if you're in virtual reality, you want to get a much higher frame rate. WebXR gives you this higher frame rate. So basically, you have a request animation frame that is bound to the WebXR API. That gives you whatever frame rate your device supports, so you get more than 60 frames per second. 60 frames per second is still all right, I would say. The problem is when you get lower than 30 frames, uh, so lower than 60 frames per second, you might have a less good experience. It's a bucket full of fun. Don't do this. So you do want to make sure that your performance is on point, and you want to test with the devices you want to support. You can learn more about A-Frame in the A-Frame School. It's an interactive tutorial that lets you build stuff in the browser. So definitely check this out. And I'd like to close with a quote. And I couldn't find a nice quote for this, so I quote myself. Steve Jobs said, if the computer is the bicycle for our minds, because it allows us to do stuff that we couldn't do physically beforehand, then VR is the teleporter. And I think that's fantastic, because that allows us to bring us to places where we haven't been. And uh, if you want to tweet this, then please do. I'm going to hold this position for a moment. Now is the time. Five, four, three, two, one. Thank you very much. Build stuff and make good stuff for the web. Awesome. Better web is what we need. Thank you very much, Martin. You're welcome. If you need, if you want to ask him, ask him something, please do. But after yes. the, I'll be around today and tomorrow if you have any yes. questions. Feel free to approach. Thank you. Thank you.